the thing I'm most passionate about is spending my time observing and understanding human behavior. You all have been the subjects for the last two days, and it's been a pleasure. So for example, I was so thrilled by the smile, the widening eyes on Emmanuel's face yesterday when his advisor complimented him because advisors sometimes forget to compliment their students unless there's a crowd present. <laughs> I loved seeing the way Grant paused and let his eyes play across the crowd and then come to rest on Aradna's face when he revealed that it was his grandmother who was the Dutch resistance fighter. And it just made me all happy inside to watch Ben and Mark last night at the dessert buffet, finishing each other's sentences seamlessly as they negotiated who was going to get the last chocolate parfait. <laughs> That's the kind of thing I spend my time doing. And so it may come as a surprise that I'm here today to talk about my belief that we need to integrate robots and virtual humans into society. Why, you might ask, if you're so fascinated by people, so in love with the way they interact, are you arguing for these technological creatures? But here's the thing. I think these technologies are here to stay. There's nothing we can do about it. And so we're faced with a choice. Do we let it happen? Do we give up our own agency? Or do we play a role taking the power back and building those technologies for good? If we do the latter, I believe that we can build robots and virtual humans, and from here on I'm going to say robots, but I include robots, virtual humans, avatars. I believe that we can build robots for good. I believe that integrating robots into society for good is going to require building robots that know what society is, that know what people are, what couples, dyads, families, communities. It's going to require robots with social skills, robots who know how to stand in line, who know how to seamlessly finish a conversation, who know how to be shy and how to compliment us when they don't usually do so. I believe that building such robots can't be done with armchair science. Oh, yeah, I know what people do. They smile. Yeah. And there are computer scientists who do this. This may come as a surprise. I think that we need to deeply understand people's social skills, people's societal integration. Their every move, those that are the most invisible to us because they are so important that we take them for granted. And so this is my work. I videotape people interacting, or sometimes I just watch them without cameras, and I analyze their behavior at 30th of a second slices. And in case you'd like to replicate this at home, it takes two hours per minute of video to understand what's going on. I look at every hand movement, every eye gaze, every posture shift, and I try and understand why it's there. And I use that information after I videotaped those people and built a model of their behavior to implement robots, virtual humans, that do the same kinds of things. And then I evaluate those robots against similar robots that don't have this deep understanding of what it means to be human. So I ask two questions that are not necessarily the usual technologist questions. One, how can we use a deep understanding of human behavior to implement machines that are better than they could otherwise be? And how do we use a deep understanding of technology to make us better than we otherwise might be? So what I'm going to do today is give you some examples. In this first example, we spent six months following a realtor around. She's the woman on the left. She's a very good realtor. I know that because she sold me a house roughly twice what I could afford. <laughs> We spent months videotaping her interacting with clients, and we watched every little move she made. And what we came to understand was that part of her power was in using small talk to broach difficult topics and to smooth over issues in communication. 
to build common ground, to understand somebody else, to overcome issues due to culture and individual differences. We used the model of human behavior that she allowed us to build to implement a virtual realtor, what we called, ha ha, an experiment in virtual realty. And then we had people interact with that realtor. And we discovered that when people interacted with the version that had small talk, they were more likely to believe what she said, to feel she knew them, to feel they knew her. And that was particularly true for extroverts. And I should point out um, that we had to leave the technological university that I worked in in those days to find extroverts. But when we did, those extroverts believed that they were better known because of that small talk. And it's a lesson we could all take to heart. <clears throat> when we evaluated her, therefore, we came to know that small talk played an important role, that it's not just icing, and that that role is particularly important in places where um, we're uh, what's called um, face-threatening somebody else, when we're saying, for example, so how much do you earn? Now, these kinds of models of behavior um, may be good, but the resultant virtual humans don't look anything like the beautiful ones you see in Hollywood. So here's a character from Final Fantasy, and you may have noticed that the virtual realtor is not quite this pretty. <laughs> She's also not as lifelike as the one in Avatar, as the avatars in Avatar. But she is not drawn by the art of an animator. In some sense, she animates herself. She has a knowledge of human behavior, an artificial intelligence that allows her to draw up an understanding of what people do, and to use that to decide what behavior to implement, what behavior to generate and to animate in any given circumstance. So those models of behavior, that observation of humans, is not just one human staring out in an audience or what happens inside one people. Those same models of behavior can be really effective in looking at dyads of behavior, groups of people or um, two people working together. So here's a piece of research that we did where we watched children collaborate to do that all-important second grade science task to build a Lego bridge, Pennsylvania science standards for the second grade. And we watched the kind of language they used with one another and we watched their nonverbal behavior. We discovered that children switch back and forth between different ways of talking. In fact, some children who speak dialects at home that are different than their school dialects switch back and forth between dialects. And that that dialect use and their style of talking has an essential effect on the collaboration. We used that model of behavior to build a virtual child. And we've been asking children to interact with the virtual child to build a Lego bridge. And what we've discovered is that with the help of the virtual child, we can teach children to use a dialect in school that the teacher wants to see them use without having them lose access to that all-important cultural touch point, which is their home dialect. And we've discovered that the virtual child can have a really essential effect on their behavior in this way that unlike the kinds of computational um, tutoring systems that you mostly use, this comes from peerness and the absence of power. These are two equals working together, and children are willing to learn things from peers that they won't learn from teachers. Those models of behavior allow us to go more broadly than the dyad or the couple of children to groups of children and they allow us to build models of behavior, of typical or normal behavior, against which we can compare abnormal or atypical behavior. So this is a study where we spent six months in um, nursery school and kindergarten classrooms, watching how children share toys, or more often refuse to share toys, how they work together, 
how they comfort one another, how they start conversations, how they stomp off when they're leaving conversations, and many of the other usual interactions in young children's day. We used those models as a point of comparison to build a virtual child who could interact with a child with autism. Now, this child doesn't have those same abilities to start a conversation or end a conversation, to collaborate, to be contingent, to continue that social um, life that is so important to all of us. And the virtual child allows us, therefore, to understand what issues a particular child is facing so that a therapist can better tailor treatment to that particular child. But we don't want children to spend the rest of their lives speaking with virtual children. We don't want children with autism to be consigned to a life facing a screen. And so a next experiment allowed us to understand that even if children with autism, such as this young girl, are more likely to be social when speaking with virtual children than with real children, we can use that fact to bootstrap their social interaction with real children. How did we do that? Once we had taught children, once we had showed children what the virtual child was and had them interact with it, we gave them a specially designed control panel that you see on the left, and we asked them to control the virtual child while the virtual child interacted with another real child. And we discovered that in interacting with that real child later, the child with autism was better able to use social skills that he or she had discovered in hypothesis testing using the control panel. In all of these cases, you're seeing robots being integrated into society on the basis of a deep knowledge of what society is, what we are, what being social is. And I believe that in this way, these robots allow us to understand what we care most about, what it means to be human, what it means to be kind and caring and close, what interaction is and what we wish it to be. And it allows us to teach those skills to people who perhaps don't come to the interaction already knowing them. I believe that it allows us to understand and to maintain what it is and what we care about in being human. Thank you. Thank you.